Block five. Get down. So, as we all know, uh, Steve Jobs died this Wednesday. He was many things. An entrepreneur, a visionary, a computer genius, an employer of thousands, a nerd, a father, a husband, a man of flesh, sinew, and bone. Many of these things will reach into the future and be his legacy. But I think the final mark that Steve Jobs will make on posterity will be further reaching than we can guess. Let me explain. So I have a number of friends who are product designers for tech and otherwise. And they have all expressed to me a similar frustration with the nature of their field. Things aren't made to last anymore! My products become obsolete in a year or less. Blast! And both are certainly true. Things aren't made to last. So during the week, I work as a telemarketer. Glamorous! And I talk to people every day whose 2005, 2006, model, whatever, is already having mechanical problems. Now, it's certainly true that the auto industry could design and build vehicles to last considerably longer than that. They don't, because if they did, you wouldn't come back in six years to buy a new one. This is called planned obsolescence. The origin of the term is credited to Bernard London in his 1932 essay entitled Ending the Depression Through Planned Obsolescence, in which he says, furniture and clothing and commodities should have a span of life just as humans have. Of course, he also proposed that there should be a special government agency deciding the lifespans of products, and anyone found using a product past its death date should be penalized. But the more judicious ideas about planned obsolescence stuck. Now, it should be said that obsolescence itself is an intrinsic feature in any free market. A company simply can't make the most durable, advanced product possible because it would violate cost efficiency. Basically, the best possible product would be so expensive to make that to turn profit, its price would be too high for anyone to want to buy it. Call that intrinsic obsolescence. Now, there's a third kind, and it occurs when a new product or technology supersedes the old. Telephone over the telegraph, DVDs over VHS, and Laserdisc, MP3s over CDs, over cassettes, over vinyl records. This is called technical obsolescence. And really, the history of the universe, the history of everything, you can look at it as a process of technical obsolescence. So in the early stages of the universe, you just had basic elements. Of those basic elements, carbon stepped forward as the most versatile because it can form bonds in four directions. Over billions of years, carbon-based molecules became more intricate, more complex. Eventually, these systems designed a precise digital mechanism to store information on how to build a larger society of molecules. This is DNA. It's sort of like a factory that holds precise records on how to build complex systems of molecules. So DNA supersedes basic matter using basic matter. Millions of years later, DNA produces organisms that can detect information via their own sensory organs. Uh... These brainy organisms can redesign the world in their own mind and put those ideas into action. With this guy right here, starts creating mechanisms of its own technology. Technology advances slow at first, but then it gets more rapid and rapid and rapid and rapid and rapid and rapid and rapid. What's next? The integration of the biological with the technological. Same make. These were taken at the West Highland Police Station, 1984. You were there. Same model. These were taken today. You have to let me see my son. He's in great danger. New mission. Well, not exactly like that, but slowly and gradually, we will take on biological components. My grandfather had a pacemaker in his chest. My other grandfather had a hearing aid. Medal of Honor recipient Sergeant First Class Leroy Petrie has a bionic hand that responds to muscle movements in his arm and is fucking awesome! The relationship between the technological and the biological will mature in the years to come. It will become more intimate. Eventually, our intelligence will take advantage of the speed and power of our technology, and our technology will take advantage of the amazing pattern recognition of our intelligence. We, as humans, will become subject to the rules of technical obsolescence. And there are those who, like my friends, get frustrated at the staying power of their products. But with technology and technical obsolescence, the whole theory of design has to be altered. Maybe the goal can't be to design something which will last, but rather to have a positive effect on the evolution of a product, to define the terms by which we will continue to think about it. Designers of both hardware and software will have a huge effect 
on the future of our race. They will be out in front of us, inventing and defining ways by which we think about ourselves. Now, if there were only someone in our day who seamlessly combined hardware and software, if there were only someone who understood that the relationship between these two things could be organic, imagine the future that we could expect if there were only a man who set the stage between the affair of intelligence and its eventual form in a way that was complimentary and profound and always elegant. And I think you still have to think differently to buy an Apple computer. Uh, and I think the people that do buy them do think differently. And they are the creative spirits in this world. They are the people that are not just out to get a job done, they're out to change the world. And they're out to change the world using whatever great tools they can get. And we make tools for those kinds of people. So hopefully, what you've seen here today are some beginning steps that give you some confidence that we too are going to think differently and serve the people that have been buying our products since the beginning. Because a lot of times people think they're crazy, but in that craziness we see genius, and those are the people we're making tools for. Thank you very much.